Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sarah Week Conversations by IHS Market. I'm Lance Ugla. I'm the CEO of IHS Market, and I'm here today with Lord Brown, former CEO of BP from 1995 to 2007. Currently, John is the executive chairman of the L1 Energy Group, an IHS board member, an active philanthropist, and also a friend. And John, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I want to get started with the question, and we're really in this surreal environment right now. And I'm wondering if you're finding any parallels that you can take, you know, from your past operating experience that would be relevant for our audience. Well, in the words of Mark Twain, uh, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. And I think the rhyming is between 1985 and 86, and what happened to the oil markets after that. In 85, Saudi Arabia was pushed into a corner. Its production dropped and dropped and dropped as they tried to control supply on the market to keep the price up. Eventually, in 86, they gave up. The market flooded with oil. Oil kept coming. Oil prices went down, and they stayed down for 17 years. The reason they stayed down, of course, is that demand wasn't very strong, and there was always more oil potentially available than demand needed. And I see lots of analogies here today. I see uh, the futility of very strong control of the market through supply management. In the end, the oil is there, so it gets produced either from inventory or from wells. Uh, and I see today a lot of weakness in demand, uh, and I see it will take some time for that demand to be restored. And it may not be restored to the levels that we've seen in the past. After all, we're starting at a much lower base, 30% down today compared with where we were a year ago. And then the last few days, we've seen this even a more unusual environment, negative oil prices. How do you see the impact uh, of that on the industry going forward? Well, negative oil prices are there simply because nobody wants the oil. Uh, there's nowhere to put it. There's no places to store it. Uh, and so you've got to pay someone to take it away. Quite what they do with it when they take it away, I don't know, because there's nowhere to put it and people don't want it. But I see this eventually changing. Uh, in the end, when there's no storage and there's no demand, people will have to cut production. And that's what they will do. But they really do need to cut production big time. If we're down 30% and we stay down 30%, that's 30 million barrels a day of uh, crude oil. And the commitments to cut at the moment are around 10 million barrels a day. So there's a big gap to a fill here. Right. Uh, and some of that you know, will come back, and maybe demand will rise a bit and so forth. But I think in the end, people will have to cut production. Right. How, how do you think the impact uh, from that will be on the independents, especially the US-based uh, uh, players that are already fairly strapped financially? Well, a lot of the independent players, certainly in the so-called unconventional or shale basins, have for many, many years operated on negative free cash flow. So they've always had to borrow money or sell assets or uh, get equity in order to keep going. There was always growth on the horizon where there wasn't any cash coming out. And so this means that these people will be very heavily hit here because debt service will not be possible uh, and uh, cash flows will be even more negative. So I would expect a significant restructuring of the independent sector, very significant. The assets don't go away. Uh, they're just put into the hands of people with uh, better finances or better financial management. And that will either be the majors or it will be some entrepreneur who figures out a different way of uh, extracting just enough oil so that they don't need to borrow money to do that. Uh, it's a sort of self-sufficiency, if you will, financial self-sufficiency that will take place. Right. And, and thinking about the national oil companies and the majors, uh, you led one of the biggest majors. How do you think they're going to adapt in this post-COVID world? So I think they've all been thinking about their strategy and I expect all of them wisely will say it's a little bit too early to make radical change, uh, but some are beginning to talk in those terms. 
I think when they look at the future, they obviously look at themselves and say, we need to be appealing to our investors. We're issuers, after all, of debt and equity, and we need to be appealing, which means that we not only have to have great financial returns, and incidentally, they haven't had great financial returns for many, many years, well over a decade, the returns have been very poor. They have to have great financial returns, but also they need to do things that society really wants them to do. So not produce so much carbon dioxide, reduce their carbon footprint, reduce their methane emission footprint. And when they look at all that, I expect they look at oil in particular and oil products, uh, that's the stuff refineries make, uh, and say to themselves, maybe this is an area where I won't actually be able to grow, I might just extract some cash and I'll let the state companies, who after all produce most of the oil in the world, to take on that business. Obviously, they'll be there, uh, there'll always be demand for oil, but demand will probably eventually go down uh, from this level. You started to um, move your conversation a little bit into climate change. And in January, I attended uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos, and I left there with this you know, the world's priority being climate change. What are your thoughts going forward on energy transition and have they shifted at all in this period of uh, the pandemic that we're operating in today? So let me say, I still think that there will be a significant transformation of the way energy is delivered to consumers, uh, the type and nature of it and how it's delivered. But stepping back and looking, we're right in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis at the moment. So again, lessons will be learned. People are beginning to think that nature and what it can do to human beings is far more, far more powerful than any prime minister, president or army. It is a gigantic force. And we have to think very carefully about resilience in the face of nature doing some pretty extraordinary things, especially if we induce them by the activities that we've done, which is namely putting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and creating a change in climate. Climate change is man-made and it will uh, be something that nature will reinforce and cause problems. So I think that's beginning to be realized, and if anything, that's probably reinforced uh, from uh, the COVID crisis. Secondly, I think people are concerned about health. I think they'll continue to be very concerned about health, not least lungs and breathing, and I think they'll really worry even more about pollution uh, than they have done in the past. And third, they'll worry about resilience uh, and you know where do supplies come from? How extended is the supply chain? Where should it uh, be? Should they be local sources of energy or distant sources of energy? And the things like wind and solar, of course, are very local. I mean, you don't, you don't move uh, the electricity over many, many, many thousands of kilometers. Uh, you keep it pretty local. So the combination of all those things says to me, uh, I think uh, energy, energy transformation is alive and well. Uh, and I think it will continue. And I do think governments will think very hard uh, about moving backwards before they take any change. I think they will want to move forward. I think many will want to think about what to do to accelerate it, uh, to put a price on carbon, let's say, or to do other things of a regulatory nature. And, and remember, I think uh, in these transitions that we see today, uh, again, too early to tell, but certainly government is back big time. After all, uh, if you, as it were, nationalize the national payroll, which is what so many governments are doing, I think your presence will be stronger, not weaker in the future. So stand by for regulation and taxes. And how do you think the, um, the actual mix of fossil fuels and, um, and renewables play out you know, coal versus uh, oil versus solar versus wind versus nuclear. What does the mix look like, in your opinion, as we go forward? 
with this so, energy price coming from crude? So the big thing, I think, is to figure out how to decarbonize hydrocarbons. And with lower input prices, it means that uh, it's generally cheaper to decarbonize uh, oil and gas and, uh, and coal. So decarbonizing through carbon capture and storage, for example, is a very big, important part of the future, as is renewables. Uh, wind and solar still have plenty of mileage, plenty of more capacity to go by becoming more and more efficient, efficiently operated and efficiently built. A hydrogen will be part of our economy, whether it's generated by surplus electricity that we can't store uh, from wind and solar, uh, and making hydrogen from water, or making hydrogen from cracking coal or gas. I think natural gas itself will be a big input into electricity for a long time and will provide the heat we need for industrial processes. Uh, that probably will not be provided by electricity, it's much more efficient uh, through uh, gas. We, we won't eliminate all hydrocarbons. What we will do is reduce their contribution, their percentage contribution uh, to the world of energy. Uh, I believe that to be right, if it is, if, so that we can get uh, the carbon content of what we do right down. And a lot of that will come by reprocessing hydrocarbons to get rid of the carbon, as well as adding new energy sources. I know as a member of the IHF Market Board, uh, we're working a lot with uh, data and then leveraging uh, information with uh, technology. And uh, really it's becoming, you know, the use of data science and, uh, and uh, the advances are really becoming an important driver of innovation uh, in the world and specifically the energy sector. What are some of your findings and views with respect to the use of data and also the use of technology that's gonna drive change going forward in the industry? So I think first at the operational level and maybe later at the board level. So first, I think at an operational level, there have been enormous advances in data science, in control systems, in so-called uh, learning systems, where, for example, we can make sure that uh, uh, machines tell us when it's time to be uh, maintained not, and, and self-maintain themselves, not actually do it on a routine basis, thereby increasing the time that they can be up and running, very important in production systems. Uh, efficiency generally, making sure that our bottlenecks are reduced by taking digital twins of uh, plant and then seeing where uh, the bits are that you could smooth out uh, and then keep doing it again and get optimizing uh, the situation. Uh, identifying things from satellites, for example, Earth observation analytics, uh, uh, AI applied to the images reprocessed allows us to track almost anything we want. Once we've seen it, uh, we can probably keep it uh, in our sights forever. So a lot of things like that are all very important in optimizing process, uh, processes, maintenance, supply chains, a, a lot of things, and also discovering things. So work, if you can build a digital model of something, it's much easier than trying to mock it up in reality out of steel, only to have to dismantle it and start again. I think the oil and gas industry has been, I started my career, for example, uh, as one of the few people who actually understood how to use a computer in the 60s and 70s, uh, using vast amounts of data to simulate the future. So the oil and gas industry is, sort of on top of it. They're just going to get really right on top of today's applications, uh, as indeed I think uh, the power sector must do as well. We all need to figure out how to not build power stations, but have virtual power stations that allow us to build in all sorts of interesting inputs into the electricity mix, because demand is very different nowadays. I think at the board level, uh, today, uh, this is all part of the ESG activity that will become even more important for boards and for investors. 
people really want to know whether what companies are saying is actually what they are really doing when it comes to everything else except generating uh, this quarter's EPS. Uh, it's more than that. They want to see that. They have to have reports. These reports need to be consistent, comparable, so that they can be benchmarked and possibly used as indexes for further investment. So I see that as one very big thing. The second thing I think boards are always concerned about is, well, maybe we can't reduce our carbon, but someone else could. Is there an offset somewhere? either a natural one, so a forest or a piece of land or something, or some other activity. And the ability to register these carbon offsets and do things with it, I think will be a very important thing for the future. The third, I think is, and it's pretty obvious today, uh, every company obviously looks at stress testing. Uh, but when you have a crisis, you really look at stress testing and regulators come in and they make sure you look at stress testing. After all, look at the financial crisis of 08, 09 and see what happened there. Here we have a natural phenomenon and I think uh, boards will want to understand what happens if stress testing, modeling the climate is going to be something which I think boards should be involved in. Obviously, managements need to know what to do. Uh, and finally, I think everybody is uh, thinking about uh, health, climate. How do we get out of this? Can we grow again? Can we get jobs back? Uh, and there has to be a path through this all. And the path has got uh, plenty of uh, different things we need to take into account. There are bad canyons on one side and there are mountains on the other. And we have to try and figure out how to get a path through uh, to build corporations of the future that really will do well uh, as things keep changing in the world. Now, I think all of that is based on really good data, really good data science, and getting the insights from that. Uh, and if there's one thing I've learned about IHS Market, I think that's the full intention of that company. I appreciate that. One final question for you, John post-COVID-19, what do you think we're going to be most surprised about? I think we'll be surprised about a rebalancing of efficiency. But on the one hand, I think we'll all become probably quite more effective in the way in which we deal with time and, and appreciate how time matters to all of us. Uh, a lot of enforced time at home allows us to rethink what we actually do with it, how we build relationships, how we build uh, our business activities using uh, digital platforms as we're all using uh, at the moment. So I think that will surprise us what happens there. I don't quite understand the outcome. I think the other thing that will surprise us is a different view of uh, efficiency when it comes to business. I think just in time, uh, spare inventory, uh, extended supply chains are all very important and they've done great things for the world, but there is a consequence they're not necessarily as robust as we need them. And so I think there'll be a rethinking of efficiency, if you mean efficiency uh, in those terms. I think there'll be a change in the way people think about business. You know, obviously, we, if you can manufacture it uh, locally, you probably should do that, provided you could do it at an effective cost. Uh, but there's more to it than that. Thank you. And John, thank you very much for joining me for the Sarah Week Conversations. I hope next year we'll be able to do this in person, of course, in Houston. But thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you.